The man that I went to visit is Cherokee. Um, his American name is Walter. And he has married an American wife, um, but he's Native American and full blood Cherokee, massive man. Walter is six foot five and well over three hundred pounds, and wow. it's all muscle. Jeez! But he was being visited at; they were being visited at their home by a very aggressive male who was hurling rocks at their home. They they were renting a home on a, far, a rural farm, and it had that older uh, hard siding on it. And a rock had been thrown so hard that it looked like a hardball had been thrown into the siding. And when I got up there, there was a massive muddy handprint on the side of the house near the back door that was from little finger to thumb was 12 inches across. And he had become so terrified by this aggression and the things that were happening and when, when I met Walter, he was packing the biggest gun on his hip that I've ever seen. Hmm. And he, he had a carry permit, and he was an open carry advocate. And he said he had called his tribal council because he, he wanted advice, and he knew his tribal council knew all about these creatures, that there was a lot of knowledge in his tribe. And his tribal council spoke to him about it and said, if it comes to a point where this thing is coming through your back door and you have to do something, the only shot that will work is a shot into the eye socket. Really? So they knew what had to be done. They said the bone across the body, uh, across the ribs, the breastplate is so thick. These creatures are so massive and the bone plate is so thick that you're not going to stop them with a single shot, that the only single shot that would work was to the eye socket. And that was the advice they gave him. Luckily, we determined what was causing the aggression, and I was able to talk him through what to change to have this thing back off and chill out and back down, and it worked, which was wonderful. What was it that finally worked? Well, I found out he had been feeding... A, a male and female that were very passive, and he could hear from the woods that they probably had youngsters with them, and he would put food out for them. He was aware they were on his property, and they would come up quietly once he backed away and went into the house. So he had started doing a vocalization when he would put food out. And I asked him when I was there, you know, what kind of vocalization do you do when you put food out? And his wife said, oh, no, 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 don't ask him to do that inside. It'll hurt your ears. And I said, well, can you do a very soft version of it? And basically, for all that I've learned about the subject, what he was doing was a male challenge call. Really? So he had drawn in this other male, and he's out there not realizing he's blasting out a big challenge, and this male is responding to it every time. So all we had to do in that instance was for him to stop vocalizing, and peace came rather quickly. Hmm. Very interesting indeed, Sibylla. Let's get back to uh, let's get back to the story that that I cut you off at the uh, the uh, end of the last segment. <laughs> this hunter has now taken several shots at Bigfoot, and as you put it, had to put one in his brain pan. Not, I mean, you didn't put it like that, but had to put one. <laughs> In his in his head in order to stop him. Is that where the kill shot finally ended up? Yes. He he basically said he had to blow the back of its brain out before it stopped coming. Wow. And one th and one thing that he said, Sam, that I'll just never forget. I guess, you know, he walked over to it after he shot it and he said the blood volume in these things is just immense. It's a tremendous amount of blood, which makes sense when you're, you know, you're talking about a, a creature of that size. I know this sounds trivial, but was the blood red? Did he say? Uh, he he didn't say. He, I think he would have said if it had been a different color, but I think okay. it was, you know, just red like you and I. Okay, so at this point, he's he's felled one. It's it's laying there. What's his next reaction? The second one ran off whenever he started shooting. And so he, uh, you know, he, he looked, um, it was dead. He got in his car and he left. And he called a friend of his to please, you know, come help him because he didn't want to leave his stuff there, but he was too terrified to stay, you know, terrified that the family would retaliate. 
so he um, his friend met him. They went back, and one stood guard while the other, you know, gathered up the stuff to get, you know, get his gear out of there. And they left. Um, and I, it was apparently still there because his friend saw, you know, what he had done. And, and his friend made a comment like, what have you done? You know, oh, my God, mm-hmm. I can't mm-hmm. even imagine. Um, I think that he did go back a few weeks later and the body was gone. So this begs the question, yeah. the, the question uh, that, you know, we have the debate all the time on these type of radio shows when it comes to Bigfoot. Do you need to kill one in order to prove it exists? This hunter killed one yet didn't do anything with the body. Mm-hmm. I'm going to ask both of you, and let's start with Ronnie. Do you feel that we actually need a dead sample of Bigfoot to prove that Bigfoot exists to all skeptics? One that would be available for scientific study, probably yes. Like Sibylla said earlier, I think our government knows all about these in fact, uh, I have a fellow researcher friend who is a federal marshal, and he has a friend in the CIA, and he asked his buddy, he said, look, I know you can't, you can't tell me anything, but just you guys know about these things. And the guy looked at him like, yeah, he said, of course we do. They're species number five. Hmm. Species number five, huh? <laughs> Interesting. Which makes you want to know what species one through four are. Right, yeah. <laughs> if there's a number. And if there are six, seven, and eight. Or even 10, but, yeah, 20, that 50. Was, that was the answer he was given, that yes, we do know all about them. Science is coming around. Um, you know, there, there have been DNA samples collected. There's been controversial DNA studies. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really do think, yes, it would take a body that was available to multiple scientific agencies and a complete study done that would be released to the public. I don't know that that's ever going to happen. Okay. Sibylla, do we need a a dead body in order to prove that Bigfoot exists? Um, I guess. You know, I, you know, people say, well, where's the bodies, where are the bodies, mm-hmm. and how come there haven't been bodies? I think there have been. I think there have been a lot of bodies collected. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't follow the side that um, that there haven't ever been bodies. I think that there have been multiple bodies collected, and I think witnesses have been threatened. You know, if you tell what you've seen or if you tell what you shot, um, you know, you, you will lose everything that you have, and you will be discredited. Your bank accounts will be seized. Um, you know, the IRS will be on your doorstep. You know, I think they've just been threatened. We know where you live. Um, do I think, um, I don't, you know, I really don't know. I, I don't, I know that they exist. So the question is, you know, occurs for me kind of differently. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I know that they exist. Like Ronnie, has, you know, had my own sightings. And so I, I, I personally don't care whether they're ever, whether the rest of science or anyone else um, subscribes to the fact that this is a living creature, I, you know, I'm, I'm just, I, I kind of feel like I just don't even care about that. I don't care whether science ever buys in. So, Bill, I, um, when, when it comes to that hunter that, that, that killed Bigfoot, does he <laughs> fear being contacted by government agencies? Does he fear backlash from whatever family that Bigfoot may have? Does he... Does he live in fear, or does he feel like, "Woo, I got away with one"? Um, I don't think he's told very many people that story. Which would be think, fair. Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of people. Um, I think a lot of there's a there's a man in North Texas who shot two, a male and a female, and I don't even know if he's still alive. But that was his secret fear that if he if he divulged where he buried the bodies, because he physically buried the bodies, um, he lived in fear. I think the last time I heard him on a radio show, uh, and I think it was with Art Bell and Robert Morgan, mm-hmm. he had created a map of where the bodies were, and he wanted to give one to Art Bell, and mm-hmm. the other you know, he was going to keep. And I don't know if that man is still alive, but he lived in fear that, yes, he would be, that if these bodies were exhumed, that he would be, um, incarcerated for killing these creatures because everything about them was human anatomically, hmm. except 
you know, their size was huge. So I do think that that is a deep concern and should be. Very interesting. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll talk more about uh, Bigfoot and uh, we'll talk about some experiences with with uh, witnesses that will get off the morbid side of, of Bigfoot here. And we'll, we'll talk about maybe some positive experiences with Bigfoot in this next segment. It's coming up next. Our guests are Sibylla Irwin and Ronnie Powell, both BFRO field researchers. And you can check out Sibylla's sketches from witness accounts at SibyllaIrwin.com. When we come back, more about Bigfoot here on Darkness Radio. For the next half hour, Sibylla Irwin and Ronnie Powell are our guests. They're both BFRO field researchers. Sibylla is a sketch artist that has sketched different witnesses' um, stories and and their descriptions of what they've seen out there in the woods. You know, I, I, I joke that we're getting off the morbid side of, of Bigfoot here now. Um, but there really is something to be said about looking out for yourself when when you either coexist with Bigfoot, which to me blows my mind, because as we sit here talking, I'm sitting in, a, in an office building in a posh and Tony uh, a city. I, I, to me, to run across Bigfoot seems almost impossible. In my mind, it's almost an impossibility for me to run into Bigfoot. No matter what time I'm traveling at night, no matter what <laughs> rural area I'm in, that's the last thing I'm thinking about. The, the thing that tends to jump in front of my truck is deer, and that's it. Um, <laughs> tell me now, now, Ronnie, we'll start with you. You obviously have had experiences. You've uh, you've been in active areas, and I believe not only do you, but Sibylla live in active Bigfoot areas. So to you, when you're out there in the woods... Give me your experience. What are you thinking? Because when I go out in the woods, I'm thinking, boy, the trees sure are pretty. Boy, that squirrel up there is really <laughs> annoying. I'd like that woodpecker to stop pecking. I'm not thinking about Bigfoot. What What should we be thinking when we go out there in the woods, Ronnie? Well, if you're if you're actively researching, which is what Sibylla and I are doing, uh, and Sibylla and I both do live in active areas. Sibylla lives on a site that has a tremendous history of activity. I think you learn to trust your senses. Every one of us has a sixth sense. The way you develop it is by paying attention to it. And it's it's nothing more than, you know, if you're a city dweller, you have that idea that I'm walking down the city street at night and I think I'm going to cut through this alley and something makes you pause and think, I don't need to go down that alley. And you don't. And the same thing happens when you're in the woods. It's paying attention to you know, just how things feel to you, the warning signs that you get. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Sibylla was talking earlier about something sneaking up on her and her son. Mm -hmm. And a few months prior to that, Sibylla and I were sitting in the same area down in the woods below her property. We had a little fire going. We had a recorder going. We're sitting in camp chairs just visiting. And yards from us, we get the most odd what sounds like Japanese samurai chatter guttural speech comes out of the woods at us. And it was so close. I mean, we just, our eyebrows shot up. We've been in the field long enough now that we kind of looked at each other and very quietly, and you hear that? Yeah, I heard that. What about you? And didn't know at the time, but the recorder had actually captured a response from further away. But another night in the same area and, and the other night was even earlier and we were closer to the house and we were sitting just in the woods just listening to the woods at night in our chairs and uh, no fire no nothing and we both looked at each other and said it's time to go and we stood up we got our chairs and the overwhelming whelming feeling was you need to leave now and we paid attention to it we gave credence to it, and we went in the house. Hmm. Sounds uh, sounds like a good way to, to live to me, just to, <laughs> to not run across it. Although when you do hear that kind of voice, I'll just I'll just interject here with something totally off the wall. If it was my gr late grandfather who would have heard it, he probably would have thought the Japanese were back. He fought in World War II. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he probably would have had memories of Corregidor all over again, <laughs> trigger that PTSD. Um, to me, I, when I, if I were to hear voices like that, I would, my first instinct, and maybe it's a dangerous instinct to have is not to run. It's to, it's to get a little more curious as to what I'm hearing. 
do we need to turn that instinct off? And, and let me let me go to Sibylla with this because you you live around an active site. Do you automatically mm-hmm. turn that instinct off when you hear something? When when you even see something, do you go, nope, not getting involved? Or as a researcher, <laughs> do you go, you know what, I, I want to follow it a little bit and see what happens? Uh, you know, it kind of depends on the vibe, and I think that's kind of what Ronnie's pointing to is that sometimes you get a vibe and. Uh, you know, there's been plenty of times when I've walked down the property to go. I have kind of a feeding area, and uh, I put gifts out um, that are like, say, a jar of peanut butter. I'll put a jar of peanut butter out. It's not, it's not something. It's not food that's going to sustain them. I don't think that's a really good idea mm-hmm. because then they, you know, start depending on you and expecting it. So I just put little gifts down. Um, but there will be times when I'm walking down uh, to that area and I will hear a wood knock and it's generally just a single wood knock and it'll be from the same direction. Okay. And, you know, and there, there are a lot of, I mean, most of the times when that happens, I don't feel creeped out. But there have been times when I've walked down there and I just knew, uh, you know, put the food here and don't stay. And there, there have definitely been times when I've stepped outside. Uh, to get something out of my truck or to put something in the trash and have felt instantly um, instantly at risk. Uh, like I was like I walked out at absolutely the wrong time. Um, so I've definitely been creeped out here. But most of the time around here it feels uh, pretty I think they've kind of you know these things I think they study your patterns like they they generally that's part of their job is to know when you're going to be out and about. You know, humans, our lives are so patterned. Oh, my gosh. You know, anybody watching, you know, myself or my neighbors, they know what time we go to work, what time we come home, you know, generally what time lights are out uh, because our lives are so patterned as human beings. And I think that that's their job to learn uh, what our patterns are and to avoid us. I think that's mostly what they do is avoid us. Um I've but I, got... one of the things one of the things when Ronnie and I first started is we would um, we would ignore our instincts a lot because you know as women uh, we're there's not that many women I know there's you know there are women in the Bigfoot uh, research community but there's mm-hmm. you know in terms of numbers there's not as many of them and when you're first starting out you know you don't want to be like the scaredy cat um, right. you know in the group so a lot of times Ronnie and I would feel um, like we should not be walking down a trail or we just get be on a trail with a group of people and get really, really what I call boogered, you know, where you just feel like, I mean, there have been times, um, there was a place in Oklahoma where, uh, we were researching an area where a man who was a former Marine had been run out of the woods with his two boys. And he literally, he just picked up his two boys, put them in the truck and left. I mean, he left his tent. He left everything in his campground. It was, he, he left because he felt that threatened. And um, he was meeting us back there. And, and he was late. I think, I can't remember what held him up. But we decided to kind of walk down to where he had had this experience. And when we get there, you know, we, we see all of his stuff is still there. I mean, it's all the tent is down and everything is kind of uh, dragged around and dirt, you know, been rained on and stuff. It, it obviously had been there for a good while. And um, while we were down there, I, I was so, I felt like at any moment we were going to get rushed out of the darkness and killed. Really? And I didn't, I didn't know anybody else was feeling that until much later uh, when I was speaking to another female member of that group and she Uh, Because I'll never forget, whenever they gave, like, the let's let's go back up, I remember being so relieved. I could not wait to get out of there because I felt we were in so much danger. And I found out later that the other woman, who's really Shannon Fole, who's a really good friend of mine, she felt exactly, exactly the same thing I was feeling. So, you know, there, and maybe women in some cases are more sensitive than men. I don't know. I haven't spoken to anybody else who was down there with us at the time, but... You know, then and Ronnie and I had another experience not very far from that location in Oklahoma where we both had the experience of feeling like we were going to be rushed and just ripped apart. You know, like there was so much hatred. Now, I don't Hmm. know if what we experienced was related to Bigfoot. I had a thermal camera, I could not see anything. I kept, you know, I kept uh, looking, I couldn't find the source of what I was feeling. Uh, and we just kept moving. But I remember thinking that we could die here. I remember feeling that we could die. And of course, I never said a word. Ronnie was, um, I found out four years later, 
Ronnie was feeling exactly the same thing I was feeling, but she didn't say anything either. You're kind of embarrassed, you know, to say yeah. things. And I think that happens to a lot to a lot of people when they're having an experience like that. You can't. It, you, we didn't hear anything. We didn't see anything. But what you felt was like uh, it was huge. I mean, it felt like we were going to die. My gosh. Well, let's take a break here. When we come back, I've got two questions uh, for you, and and. They may surprise you. One has to do with, you know, I, I've heard a lot over the last couple of hours, both of you talking about leaving stuff out for them, people leaving stuff out for them. Is that really a good idea? And second, is the Bigfoot human relationship much like dogs and cats? Are we not meant to coexist? I'm going to ask you that question when we come back. Our guests are Sibylla Irwin and Ronnie Powell, both BFRO field researchers. And we'll talk about whether we should be coexisting with Bigfoot next on Darkness Radio. Throughout the program, we've talked a little bit about leaving food out for Bigfoot families, maybe being a good neighbor, or getting that feeling, Sibylla, like you had said, you've got that that feeling that you were in danger. And I guess the way I would put this to our audience is, is it like dogs and cats trying to live together? Is it is it something where genetically, maybe deep down in our DNA, we're not meant to be together? Maybe we're the curiosity is fine, kind of like us and bears, Okay. The curiosity is fine. We get close to each other and there's something in the way like food or survival or fear. That relationship changes completely and it could be adversarial. It could be life or death. So let me start with Ronnie. Ronnie, do you believe we're meant to coexist? I think that all interaction is always going to be on their terms from my experience. So I'm dealing a lot with rural families who are being visited by these these beings. And, you know, they there may be a series of events that happen that is causing them to wonder, what's doing this on my property? What's moving things around? What's taking the dog food or stealing the chicken feed or whatever? Or who took the fruit off my pear tree? And then eventually one of them decides to show itself. And I really, truly believe that what the human does at that point is going to set the tone for whether the encounters continue or cease. But it's always all on their terms. I think they're very, very curious about us. I think they're drawn to certain situations. I see the same elements over and over again where these families, you know, rural living families are being visited um, I, I'm not a big advocate of putting food out. I have coached uh, one family to do it simply because they were coming up to the house and raiding the trash cans and slamming them up against the house and so terrifying the families that we decided to put food 70 yards away down in the woods to try to get them to back off a little bit, and that worked to a point. Hmm. But I think the, the key element here is and I know there are people who call themselves habituators who will totally disagree with this. This is my personal belief, but I've, I've done so many, I've dozens of these cases now that I see the same things over and over. It's always on their terms. It's They are the masters of the forest, and they're going to set the tone for everything. But then and that, that... how it proceeds is based on how we react. That flies kind of in the face of how human beings operate, though, Ronnie. We we believe we're, we're the master of the domain. I mean, we were given dominion over all animals, right? I mean, according to the Bible. So we got to have dominion over Bigfoot, right? Doesn't that mean we're going to bump heads a lot? Uh, I think with the with that attitude, we most certainly would, you know. But generally, the people that I'm dealing with, once they've had a look at these things and they are so shocked, first you've had the reality shoved in their your face. Uh, and then the immense size and the immense power that they know they're facing, I think uh, some people become okay with the visits. Some people are perhaps uh, wanting to encourage the visits, which I don't agree with. And some people are absolutely terrified and want them to go away. And we try to help them do that if that's the case. Where Sibylla lives, she's living where uh, a woman fed a family group of them for over 40 years. 
So there's an amazing long history there. They've been there forever. They still are there. So Sibylla is dealing with them, and I'll let her speak to that. It, but it's on their terms. Sibylla? Uh, and, and I think that's a good point, too. I don't think I would have... Uh, well, first, too, I, I moved here because of the history of the of the place because I wanted to experience that. And I had the, you know, I was blessed with the opportunity to come here. Um, and, you know, this, this belies their intelligence. They didn't just um, accept me. You know, they didn't, they didn't just like say the, the, I've, I've had to spend years. I've been here four years now to gain their trust. So what does that tell you? And if it was just a stray dog, you know, if it had the intelligence, I mean, we all know dogs are really intelligent, but mm-hmm. if it, and I'm not saying that they don't, I'm just saying if it was a dog, I think it, you know, the, um, the trust could have been just transferred to me, but that's not what happened. You know, mm-hmm. I've had to be here for years and I'm still trying to gain their trust. I mean, that's how cautious they are. They're very, very 